Thank you, and thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak about data and competition. The organizers, the organizers told me the same thing as they told Randall. They told me, uh, they asked me to make a sexy title. And uh, <laughs> it looks like Randall and I have the same notion about what sexy is. <laughs> so that's at least a common point. Uh, crossing the, the American-Europe divide. So. <laughs> Anyway, um, so I'm the chief economist of the French Competition Authority, and I will be speaking on my own behalf only. Um, and as the title says, I'm going to speak only about data-related mergers. I'm not really going to talk about antitrust, except maybe at the end if I have the time. Um, we have several merger decisions that are dealing with data-related issues. Uh, the names are on the slides, and you all you have heard about them. Some of them are quite a bit old now, like Google DoubleClick, that was in 2008. We have uh, the last one, one of the most recent one is Apple Shazam, which was last year. And we have Solo Logikimo in France, which was also uh, last year. We're going to talk at the, the issues that have been raised in these decisions and that are related to data. We have two issues there. The first one is what I have called the data advantage scenario. I'm going to describe it a little bit later on. The second one is the data increase scenario. And keep in mind that I'm only going to talk about data-related subjects. These decisions raise many other points, but I'm only going to talk about the data-related data ones. First caveat. The second caveat is that due to time constraints, I'm going to oversimplify the reasoning. Bear this in mind also. If you look at the decisions, they are all based on several arguments, not on a single one, but on several arguments. And it's the compilation of these arguments that leads to the conclusion. Um, what's interesting is that in all these decisions, data, although the scenarios had been identified, data has never been rated as a competitive risk once all the facts have been carefully looked at. Uh, so the main point is to say why. Why is it that when we're thinking about these operations, we all think about data risk. And why is it that, well, the risk didn't turn out to be so high, at least at the time of examination. And then if time allows, we will have, uh, I will raise some possible discussion points. So first, uh, first issue, the, what, what I have called the data advantage scenario. It's fairly simple. We have three companies, and they, they produce services, and all of them rely on some data, OK? Two of these companies merge. And when they merge, they may also merge their data set. And thanks to this merging of data sets, they're going to, be, they're going to have more data. They're going to produce more services or more high-quality services, like targeted ads, for instance. And of course, because they become more efficient thanks to this data, they grow. And not only do they grow, but their competitors, due, for instance, to network effects, their competitor will see that its market share is decreasing because compared to AB, the new entity, it gets more and more, less and less attractive. And also, if you think about entry barriers, now in order to compete with AB, you need much more data than before. And this is uh, an entry barrier that has been created thanks to the merger. So that's the first setting, very simple. Another one, which is as simple but slightly different, uh, is that, for instance, uh, you have a company A which owns some data. And you have another company which has no data at all. And this company B is not competing with A, OK? B is only competing with C. Then we have a merger between A and B. That's what we may call a vertical merger or a conglomerate merger, OK? Because A and B are not competing with each other. Then we have the same story as before. B will get A's data. And thanks to this data, the new entity AB is going to get bigger and bigger, more efficient, more consumers, more data, more consumers, and so on. And C, of course, is going to go smaller, OK? So this is a basic scenario. It looks very simple. And probably this is what we all have in mind when we're thinking about some data-related mergers. So now let's have a look uh, at some uh, real cases and what has happened. 
So this is the case with the Microsoft, uh, the, the merger, well, or the, the exclusive contract between Microsoft Bing and Yahoo regarding the search engines. Of course, we have a data advantage story there. Microsoft will get the data from Yahoo, and thus they will get more data, and they're going to be more efficient. So we have clearly the data advantage scenario. Is that a problem? Not really, because Microsoft Yahoo is competing with a much larger competitor, which is Google, which has much more, more data. So the data advantage risk can be turned around. It's a data advantage opportunity. And this is what the commissioner has taken into account when it finally decided to not to prohibit this, uh, this merger. So that's fairly simple. Another case. Um, let us assume that we have a company A, which has some data, okay? It is not competing with company B, which also has some data. B is competing with C. Okay, A and B merge, as usual. And of course, then we have the fear that A is going to transfer its data to B, and B will get bigger, while C will get smaller. That's the data advantage risk. Is that so simple? Well, are the data owned by A so useful in order to sell B's products? This may not be the case. If you look at the Apple Shazam decision, this was one of the risks that the Commission, the European Commission studied. When Apple bought Shazam, were the data owned by Shazam useful to send music stream? The European Commission asked many operators about the potential risk, and the conclusion was there is maybe a very, 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 very small advantage, but not significant. And so we don't have the data advantage risk because of, uh, the accumulation of data, of A's data in B will not produce a substantial advantage. So the market structure will stay the same. Another data advantage scenario. Uh, let's look at WhatsApp Facebook, for instance, at that decision. So we have Facebook, which buys WhatsApp. And of course, the risk, what is it? Facebook will grab a hold of WhatsApp uh, data. Is that so simple? The commission thought at that time, no. Why so? First, it said Facebook wouldn't be uh, allowed to get a hold of WhatsApp data because of the GDPR. Those people who use Facebook have only given the consent to use data for WhatsApp, not for Facebook. Okay. We have seen earlier that things are a bit more ambiguous when, once we take Facebook behavior into, into account. Another problem is that at that time, in 2014, the Commission thought that WhatsApp didn't have enough market power to increase its data and to send it to Apple. One of the facts that was noted by the Commission at that time was that as soon as Apple announced that it was buying WhatsApp, WhatsApp lost 20% of its subscribers for fear of data transfers. And another problem is technical issues. We think that merging data is very, very easy. This may not be the case. At least this is what Apple told the commission. Uh, this is what Facebook told the commission at that time. It said, I wouldn't be able to merge the data set of WhatsApp and of Facebook. And two years later, the commission realized that this was a lie because at that time, Apple, uh, Facebook was already able to merge this data and Facebook has been condemned for this, uh, for this lie. There are many other reasons why the merger between Facebook and WhatsApp have been, uh, has been authorized. It was not only this technical issue. The same kind of reasoning is used in Google DoubleClick and in Microsoft LinkedIn, and I'm not going to give up it. Let's move on. Another uh, obstacle to the data advantage scenario. So we have Facebook and WhatsApp, and we have many other uh, platforms, communication services, or social network services. And so they're merging together. So we may fear that there's going to be a huge data advantage. But what the commission says is, no way, there won't be any data advantage because there is so much data everywhere available for everyone, not only for Facebook and WhatsApp, but all other kind of platforms can use this data through third parties and so on. So this is one peculiarity of a digital word, data is everywhere. So it's very hard 
to get a data advantage when there is so much data everywhere. That's what the Commission thought, at least in 2014. And so the market structure is not, is not changed, and the operation is authorized. Again, this was one argument on top of several others. Also see Google double click and there is on Yahoo, same reasoning. Same reasoning, you can see the, the slides. Uh, Google double click, for instance, for combination of data that searches Google data with data about users' web surfing behavior, double click uh, data, is already available to a number of Google's competitors today. Which competitors? Microsoft, Yahoo, third parties, internet service providers, and so on. Let us come to the Seloger Logikimo decision. Seloger and Logikimo are um, real estate portals for non French uh, uh, audience. These are portals on which real estate agencies go to publish their ads for the goods, the houses, the flats that they sell. And this is the portals where consumers go when they want to rent or to buy a house. They have some competitors like Le Bon Coin, bien ici, and several others. And uh, they all have end consumers, internet viewers, and they also have uh, real estate agencies. Of course, when Seloger buys Logikimo, we have a data advantage story in mind. Seloger and Logikimo will get more data. So they will have an advantage over the competitors and they will get bigger. And because we are on a market with network effects, this will be bad for competition. But again, not so simple. Why? First, end consumers and estate agencies, they use on average four real estate portals. Four. Which means that when Seloger has some data about a particular consumer, they are three other portals, on average, that have the same data. And this is true for end consumers, and it is true for real estate agencies. First issue. Second issue, because end consumers use several real estate portals, when Seloge buys Logikimo, will it get much more data? No, because most of the consumers of Logikimo, they already use Seloge. So Seloger already has the data. And finally, when you look at data, what is the relevant metrics of data? It's not market share in value. It would rather be market share in volumes, number of consumers, number of ads. Who is the stronger when you look at the number of ads or number of viewers? It is Le Bon Coin, much bigger than the new company of Seloger and Logikimo. And also Pianissi is probably going to be much bigger because Pianissi is a subsidiary of all the real estate agencies. So the real estate agencies are going to give possibly much more data to Pianissi than to other portals. Okay, uh, time is running, so I may skip the Microsoft LinkedIn, but it's kind of the same story as, as before. So that was the first scenario about the data advantage. The important thing to see is that a scenario has been spotted, and that's the first part of the story. The second part is, is this scenario realistic, given all the facts that we know about the market? Second scenario is the data increase scenario. We're more into data collection here. It's like a price increase. You know, what is the fear when two companies merge? The fear is that price is going to increase. If we are on a, on a market on which the service is free, the fear is that data collection is going to increase, okay? Is this fear justified? Let us see the fairly simple uh, sketch here. We have three companies, A, B, and C. They are competing, and we have consumers and customers. Each of these companies collects some data, okay? We may think that the, the amount of data collection is the result of an equilibrium. Why? Because, for instance, if A chooses to collect more data, the risk is that some consumers or customers are going to move. They're going to move to B, or they're going to move to C. And so, of course, A has a trade-off. 
I want to collect more data, but if I do so, I'm going to lose some consumers. So there is a trade-off to be made. Now let us assume that we have a merger between A and B. What's going to happen? Well, A will be able to collect more data than before. Because if a consumer goes to B, if a consumer is unhappy with the increased data collection by A, this consumer will go to B. But this consumer is no longer lost for A, because A and B are the same company. OK? So this is the risk of uh, increased data uh, collection. But again, the scenario is not that simple. Because first, when you look at all the past cases that we had, it was only you have only few cases where firms are really competing one with the other. Most of the times we have vertical mergers or we have conglomerate mergers. Okay, so they're not direct competitors, so this effect does not come into play. The second is that we have a GDPR, and this is, sets a limit to data collection. And the third limit is that, as Randall said, the consumer is not much informed about data collection. What does that mean? It means that actually many companies, they already set the amount of data collection to the top. And it does not matter whether they acquire B or not. They're already at the top because the consumer either does not care or is not informed. A more, a more tricky scenario is, the first, is that one. We have two companies, A and B. They are not competing one with the other. And a is competing with C, and B is competing with D, okay? B does not collect any data, but it is bought out but by A, and A needs some data. So possibly what A will do is that A will instruct B into collecting data, and then A will grab the data. This is something that happened with Facebook WhatsApp. This is something that may have happened with Facebook WhatsApp. When, when WhatsApp was bought, it was not collecting any data because it has a very strict privacy policy. Its model was not about selling ads and so on. Its model was something else. No one knew what the model was at that time, actually. But once it had been bought by Apple, then the data transfer found uh, motivation. Okay, but at that time, WhatsApp was only a very, very small market player. And as I said, the Commission thought that many consumers are going to flee away from WhatsApp if they see that info, some information is going to be taken. I have some time left for possible discussion. Yeah. When we think about merger control related to data, there are two things that can be difficult. There won't be any slides here. I'm going to shorten my, my discussion because of time constraints. The first one is that these are markets with zero sales. Sometimes you target a company, it has no sales at all because it sells free services. It is not present on the advertising market yet. So its turnover can be either zero or it can be very low. It can be below the notification thresholds. For instance, in the last 17 years, Google has bought something like 270 companies, but only one of this acquisition was notified to the European Commission. Fortunately, there is a simple solution for this, and many uh, countries are working towards it. It's to lower the notification threshold, or it's to change the definition of a threshold. Instead of using sales, use the, transac uh, the transaction value. And the third solution is to use ex post control. That is, I do not intervene yet, but I have a certain time to intervene once the merger has been done in order to disentangle the merger if I see that there are some anti-competitive effects. So that's the first difficulty, but I think that there are some solutions. A second difficulty when we're dealing about merger control in these markets, the second difficulty is that these markets are nascent, recent markets, and they keep evolving all the time. And when we are in military control, we have to think ahead. We have to think, what will be the outcome equilibrium in five years' time? What will be the conduct of companies in five years' time? And when we see that these markets are changing so rapidly, 
this exercise can be really difficult. And this is combined with another difficulty is that if you look at merger control, in order to prohibit a merger, you have a standard of proof to respect. You have to bring some evidence that the risk of an anti-competitive conduct is high. And if you are much in certainty, this demonstration is much harder to make. This is one of the questions about, many, about which many uh, economists and lawyers are thinking about. Uh, I'm thinking about Tomaso Valetti, the chief economist from the European Commission. I'm thinking about uh, the Furman report to which uh, Randall uh, also referred to uh, early on. I'm thinking also about the Ser uh, report on digital conglomerates. What this report says is that maybe when we're looking at acquisition made by super dominant companies, maybe we should think about not only taking the probabilities of having an anti-competitive result, but also think about the cost of making the bad decision. What is the more costly? Is it to prohibit Google or Facebook from buying a company? Or is it to let Google buy an, a company and see that competition is reduced, even though the probability may be low? Okay? Because we know that there is a risk of mistake, but if we make that mistake, the cost can be very important. Okay? This is one of the reports which is made sometimes towards the Facebook WhatsApp decision. Because at that time in 2014, WhatsApp didn't really look like a competitor, and in, at least on the advertising market. And uh, possibly, it may have been a competitor five, five years later. We will never know. But possibly, the cost of prohibiting is, is too high. But again, this means shifting a little bit, modifying the burden of proof. Um, I think I'm going to make just one last point, if I have one minute. Talking more about general antitrust, it is often uh, said that uh, antitrust comes sometimes too late. I don't think that is so true if you look at all the decisions, recent decisions by the Commission. Of course, we have a Google shopping decision, which has been later, uh, waited for quite a long time. But this was because of an exceptional circumstance, which was a failed commitment procedures. If you look at the other cases, Google cases, they took a fairly short amount of time. That's the first thing. And the second thing, if we are reasonably certain that there is a, a competitive risk with a given conduct, we have interim measures that suspend the conduct. Okay, and this has been used recently by the French Competition Authority no later than uh, two, um, two months ago against Google, against the referencing criteria uh, by Google. Thank you very much. Thank you.